tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. For six-year-old Catherine Corzilius, it was just a short walk home. But something terrible happened on the way. Now the mystery of Catherine's tragic death and her parents' desperate search for answers has been chronicled in a song by family friend and rock artist John Bon Jovi. His life of crime began when he was just six years old. Now he's considered the best cat burglar in America, and he has relieved his wealthy victims of $30 million. Beware of the dinnertime bandit. The Gulf War, the Oklahoma City bombing, the earthquake in Kobe, Japan. According to the best-selling book, The Bible Code, these events and many others were predicted nearly 3,000 years ago. Does the ancient text of the Bible contain a secret code that charts the history of mankind? You'll meet a young mother who says she needs your help. Several years ago, her five-month-old baby vanished. Now police believe it was foul play, and she may be the key suspect. When the police sit across from you and say, we believe you know where your daughter is and we believe you know who has her, there's a good reason to get an attorney. Join me for these intriguing stories and more. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Even though she was just six years old, Catherine Corzilia seemed to be leading a charmed life. She lived in an upscale neighborhood outside Austin, Texas, with her parents, Nancy and Paul, and her brother, Chris. Her father was a personal manager for rock star John Bon Jovi. The two families were close and often vacationed together. When Catherine had her first piano recital in December of 1995, no one could have imagined that she would never live to see the first grade, and that her death would become a tragic unsolved mystery, memorialized by her father's old friend, John Bon Jovi. Tell me it was just a dream, August 7, 415. That's when Nancy and Paul Corzilius's world came crashing down. August 7th, 1996 was Paul Corzilius' birthday. He was working at his office in New York City. Nancy and the kids had spent the day running errands around Austin, picking out a gift for him. You know, I think Dad's really going to like his present. I think he will, too. Hey, Chris. Catherine, <laughs> settle down. We had been very busy, as usual, making, doing some shopping and taking in some uh, lunch and some appointments. It was extremely hot. It uh, was very quiet here in our neighborhood, as it usually is. In fact, I, I can remark that it, it was exceptionally quiet that day. On the way home, they stopped at the community mailbox to pick up the mail. It was a ritual Catherine looked forward to. Nancy knew what would happen next. Mommy, may I walk home? Sure. I'll see you when you get there. Okay. It was Catherine's way of saying she was a big girl. I allowed Catherine to do that because I knew she was ready to be more independent, and she had done it before. Nancy and Chris drove home in the direction the car was already facing. Catherine went in the opposite direction, the shorter way home. The Corzilius family lives here on Elder Circle. The community mailboxes are located here. Nancy and Chris drove home in this direction. Catherine apparently followed this route. Both of my children had walked home together and separately from the mailboxes. 
It's a short walk, probably less than a quarter of a mile. When Chris and I got home, we unloaded our car and started putting our packages away. Mom, what? Catherine's not back. Well, she probably just stopped somewhere along the way. Go back up on the road, see if you can find her. All right. He came back in just a very short period of time, a few minutes, and he was crying, and he said, she's not there, Mom. We got in the car and drove right next door to our neighbors. I ran down the steps to their front door, knocked on the door. Their son answered. Hi, is Catherine here? No, ma'am. She hasn't been by here at all? Mm -mm. I believe uh, at that moment, Chris and I knew that something terrible had happened. Nancy would find out how terrible just minutes later. tell that she was unconscious, but she was breathing, and I knew it was too hot to leave her on the pavement. I know that it's never a good idea to move somebody if you don't know what their injuries are, but I just couldn't leave her there, and I think having driven her to the emergency before, knowing the way very well, I felt confident that I was able to, to drive that drive. Catherine Corzilius had suffered a fractured skull. She never regained consciousness. Catherine was on a ventilator to keep her breathing, but she was brain dead. It wasn't a matter of her being in a coma or being unconscious. Uh, her brain had died. I arranged for a charter aircraft so that I could come directly home, but in the end, it was too late anyway. I arrived at 12.30 in the morning, and. I believe she was pronounced dead at 11.30 that night, an hour before my arrival. From the start, everyone assumed that Catherine Corzilius was a victim of a hit and run. But even as the police searched for a driver, a disturbing question surfaced. How did Catherine end up in the spot where she was found? Catherine was last seen headed in this direction. Less than 10 minutes later, she was found here on the opposite side of the circle, half a mile away. The extent of her injuries were such that she didn't take a step after she received the injury. And the point that her body was found on Elder Circle is not on the path that she walked from the mailbox to the house. No one could explain it. And the medical examiner's report would only deepen the mystery he determined that Catherine had not died from a hit-and-run accident. In addition to the head injury, he found abrasions on Catherine's left shoulder, the small of her back, on her right hip, and on both knees. What could have caused them? The injuries that Catherine sustained could have been the result of either uh, jumping from a moving vehicle, uh, being thrown from a moving vehicle or falling from a moving vehicle. The type of injuries that we expect, expect in these circumstances would have been the same. If Catherine did tumble from a moving vehicle, whose vehicle was it? And was she pushed or did she fall? One of the theories that the investigators proposed was that indeed somehow Catherine had jumped on the back of our vehicle without Nancy's knowledge. And uh, as the vehicle drove around Elder Circle, she had fallen off, which was uh, a way to explain where she was found in Elder Circle, which is completely opposite of where she would have been on her normal route. The Corzilius family was stunned. Was it possible that Nancy was responsible for her daughter's death? The Corzilius's hired their own private investigator, Barbara O'Brien. She has difficulty with a police scenario. Now, the problem with that is it's a hot August day. This whole car would have been very, very hot. There's only one place to hold on to all the way up here. And the door is the only other place down here to hold on to, and it opens when you get a hold of it. She also had a broken left thumb, and she had a splint on her thumb. So it would have been extremely difficult for her to get a hold on anything. And her mother would have seen her in the rearview mirror. 
For the Corzilius family, the implication is clear. They believe their daughter was abducted and murdered. A search of a vacant, overgrown lot just 30 yards from the mailboxes may have provided a crucial clue. A few days after Catherine's uh, death, the investigators did bring in the canine unit and search the area. They did pick up her scent over in this vacant lot, which would indicate that she was coming in this direction from the mailboxes, taking the most direct route home. The scent was lost, however, which tells us that this may have been the point where she was abducted or the injury took place, but she was then later moved where she was found by her mother. She looked like she'd been laid out there for me to find. Her hair was smoothed down. Her shirt was straight. Her shorts were straight. Her toes were pointed straight. Her sandals were on. I know someone moved her, and I know someone laid her there for me to find. What did happen to Catherine Corzilius that August afternoon? A year after her death, Catherine lives on in memories. Her neighbors on Elder Circle have planted a tree and placed a plaque in her name. I think if Paul and Nancy's parents knew how it happened, perhaps it could help them with the closure of this tragic event. Nothing that anyone can say or do is ever going to bring their daughter back to them. But it's twice as hard not knowing what happened. I think of uh, families of people who are missing in action. Well, they're not here, but what happened to them? And that's exactly, to a certain extent, how I feel about our daughter. I had Catherine's body, but something happened in the last 15 minutes of her life that I'll, I don't know what that was. He's charming and attractive, and may be out to steal your jewels. Have you seen Alan Golder? He looks like just another tourist. He rides tour buses to see the homes of the rich and famous. He admires the finer things in life, especially if they belong to someone else. His name is Alan Golder, and his prior profession was jewel thief. Police believe he's at it again. During the daytime, he cases fashionable neighborhoods, so at night he can find the perfect moment to strike. While he's upstairs, the owners of the home are downstairs having dinner. Alan is very good at what he does. He gets a thrill out of what he does. He has no other goal in life other than to be the best jewel thief that he can be. 42-year-old Alan Golder was arguably the best cat burglar in the United States. From 1976 to 1980, Golder made millions stealing jewelry. He was caught and served 15 years in prison. But since his release in 1996, Golder may have reclaimed his title as a dinnertime bandit. Police are seeking your help to catch a thief. Golder's life of crime began early, at the age of six. He grew up poor in Long Island, New York. His father, a career criminal, had abandoned the family when Alan was three. At 16, Golder dropped out of high school. Even at that young age, he was earning anywhere from a few hundred to several thousand dollars a night by stealing. At 21, Alan Golder had found his niche, burglarizing the homes of wealthy people in Greenwich, Connecticut. He thinks he is today's answer to the Pink Panther. He's in it for the thrill that he gets out of it. As I think about things now, I, I, in some ways I'm amazed Alan hasn't come forward just because he's missing all these wonderful opportunities to be interviewed by different TV shows. Between 1976 and 1980, Alan Golder had some very good years. 
It's estimated that he stole at least $25 million worth of jewels and gems from the richest people in America. When you think about the crimes that he committed, the ordinary person would have said, well, with as much money as he's gotten, why didn't he stop? It was like an art for him. And in another way, it was almost compulsive for him, as if he's suffering from some sort of compulsive disorder. Golder's reputation caught the attention of the mob. It happened when he tried to fence some stolen jewelry at a shop in New York. What it turns out is that this particular jewel store was a front for the uh, Genovese family's uh, international jewel fencing operation. So being 19 years old or whatever he was at the time, he didn't really know what he was getting into at that point. He was just trying to sell some jewels. But what he did was he was, in, in, in fact, getting in bed with the mafia. The mob liked Golder's ambition and took him under their wing. They wanted to change him into an international jewel thief. He would go meet them in New York, and he would hang out with them, and they would take him out to restaurants. It was sort of a, a Pygmalion thing that went on. I mean, they sort of groomed him for the business. You have to look for the three C's in a diamond, the color, the cut, and the clarity. Don't pick me up diamonds from, from a box on top of the dresser. These are never good. Nobody keeps expensive diamonds on top of the dresser. Very closely. But it was his relationship with the mafia that would lead to Golder's downfall. In 1978, Golder was being pressured to bring in more jewelry. He and two other mafia jewel thieves were instructed to hit a home in the Hamptons. It's believed that Golder never carried a weapon, but one of his accomplices did. Alan claims he never even saw the guy. It happened in another room, another part of the house. And uh, they didn't know if they'd killed him or not, uh, but they found out the next day that the man died. Alan Golder's life spun out of control. He was doing drugs and going through money like water. Eventually, he was caught. Facing a murder charge, he looked for a way to reduce his sentence. Now, you know that we got you at the Lever Estate two times previous that we know of. Now, I need you to tell me specific names and specific numbers right there on that piece of paper, all right? In exchange for selling out the mob, Golder was given a sentence of 15 years to life. You can assume that there was a contract out on his life. He became a, an official protective witness, and when he was in the entire time he was in prison, he was you know, basically in protective custody in prison. He did, wasn't housed with the regular inmates. He was housed with guys that were special cases that they had to watch out for so that he wouldn't be killed. But according to authorities, while in prison, Golder continued to sift through magazines profiling the homes of the wealthy. Following his parole in 1996, he tried to go straight, or so he said. He even had a job in mind, working as a chimney sweep. I explained to him, there are certain employment positions that you, because of your conviction and your criminal history, you cannot work. And entering into people's homes to clean chimneys is one of them. Then after that, he had considered pursuing school. We had talked at length as to what sort of careers he could choose, but he was sort of set on going to a gemology school. He wanted to study gems. Not long after, police had another rash of high-profile burglaries on their hands. But Alan Golder was not a suspect at the time. But in October 1997 in Greenwich, Connecticut, police believe Golder pushed his luck a bit too far. He allegedly was forced to tie up a homeowner and fled in her car. Now police believe the dinnertime bandit was back in business. Alan Golder apparently went underground. We can confirm that in Greenwich, um, in 23 incidents of burglary or attempted burglaries, Alan succeeded in removing over $750,000 worth of jewelry from the houses that he had here. In his career, Golder has stolen more than $30 million worth of jewelry, and police believe he has no intention of stopping. 
Alan Golder is wanted on 23 counts of burglary and one count of kidnapping. Coming up, some say there are codes in the Bible that predict major world events. You decide if it's true. The Bible, for centuries mankind has pondered its mysteries. For many, it's the Word of God. But journalist Michael Drazen is convinced that the Bible may hold still other mysteries. His controversial book, The Bible Code, hit the bestseller list soon after its publication in early 1997. Drazen claims that there is a secret code within the Bible, a code that has predicted the most important events of the 20th century. Here are some examples. The greatest terrorist event in American history, the Oklahoma City bombing, was encoded with the words terrible, frightening death, and there will be terror. The great Kobe earthquake in Japan that killed more than 5,000 people was encoded with the words earthquake, fire, Kobe, Japan, and the year that it took place, 1995. The Gulf War is encoded with the words Hussein, enemy, scuds, ever since there was a Bible. People have been searching for secret hidden messages in the Bible. I can tell you that there is no doubt that the Bible code does exist and that it does detail events that took place thousands of years after the Bible was written. In September of 1994, Michael Drosnan persuaded an intermediary to hand deliver a letter to Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Mr. Prime Minister, an Israeli mathematician has discovered a hidden code in the Bible. The only time your full name, Yitzhak Rabin, is encoded in the Bible, the words assassin that will assassinate cross your name. That should not be ignored. I think you are in real danger but that the danger can be averted. Fourteen months later, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin spoke at a peace rally in Tel Aviv. It was the last speech Rabin would ever give. As he left the podium that night, he was gunned down by an assassin. Is it possible that this event was foretold nearly 3,000 years ago? The Torah. It is said to be the word of God brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses and incorporating the first five books of the Old Testament. Hebrew scholars maintain that the Torah predates the birth of Christ. Prague, Czechoslovakia, 1938. Rabbi H.M.D. Weissman, discovered the first known example of Bible coding in the modern era. The word Torah was spelled out when he skipped every 50 letters in the book of Genesis. Skipping the same number of letters in the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy brought the same result. Coincidence? The odds were against it. Over the next 50 years, advances in computer technology led to the next major breakthrough in cracking the Bible code. Israeli scientists Doron Witzdom and Eliyahu Rips became intrigued by Weiss Mandel's work. They used a computer program called a skip code to find words and patterns in the Hebrew text of the Torah. A skip code tells a computer to start with any letter of a text and then skip through the letters at chosen intervals. In his book, Michael Drazen uses this example to show how it works. If you skip every three letters of this sentence, it would look like this. You are left with a new sentence. In this case, the encoded message is, read the code. The Israeli mathematicians ran a skip code searching for the names of 34 prominent Jewish rabbis spanning the last 1,100 years. Amazingly, 
All the names were found embedded in the book of Genesis. When the computer found the encoded names of the rabbis, it also found nearby their Hebrew dates of birth or death. The scientists ran the search again with a new list of rabbis. The results were the same. According to Michael Drosnan, the odds of finding the dates with the names were 10 million to one. When these findings were published, they aroused the attention of researchers around the world, including Harold Gans. Gans is a former senior cryptologic mathematician, a code breaker at the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, when I first heard about it, I dismissed it as simply ridiculous. Gans wrote his own computer program to test the validity of the code and had identical results. Then in close proximity to the rabbis, one of whom was a distant relative, he found the encoded names of cities. He later learned that these were the same cities where the rabbis had either been born or died. The odds here were more than a million to one. Now he set out to prove that it was nonsense. Instead, I ended up proving that, in fact, it was true. I must admit, I felt a chill go up my spine when I, when I saw it corroborated. Journalist Michael Drosnan took the research a step further. Using the existing skip code programs, he searched for the names of historical figures. The results were tantalizing, but not entirely convincing at first. I did not fully believe the Bible code was real until the day that Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. The one time his name appeared in the Bible, the words, assassin will assassinate, ran right across his name. Drosnan embarked on his own ambitious research into the mysteries of the Bible code. He now included a wide range of history's most important personalities and pivotal events. If Drosnan is correct, everything that follows was predicted nearly 3,000 years ago. According to Drosnan, Adolf Hitler is encoded with the words Nazi and enemy, evil man, and slaughter. Pearl Harbor is encoded with the words destruction of the fortress, world war, and December 7th. According to Drosnan, Watergate is encoded with Nixon, and who is he? president, but he was kicked out. In the case of the Oklahoma City bombing, Drosnan claims the code is surprisingly accurate. He says it includes the name of the building that was blown up, the Murrah Building, the date and time of the attack, and even the name of the man convicted of the crime, Timothy McVeigh. But not everything in the code is gloom and doom. Drosnan notes that Shakespeare is encoded with Macbeth and Hamlet. The Wright brothers are encoded with airplane. And the phrase man on the moon appears with spaceship and Apollo 11. But there are those who question Drosnan's claims. Humans are pattern-seeking animals. We look for cause and effect relationships in our environment, meaningful ones. Michael Shermer is a publisher of Skeptic Magazine. He believes the Bible Code is an example of self-fulfilling prophecy. The Bible Code is nothing more than a form of seeking you shall find, whether you're using the Bible or the dictionary, the yellow pages, some other novels. All you need is a long string of uh, letters, and then you can run your computer skip code sequence program and come up with all kinds of things. Michael Drosnan disagrees. He says he ran the skip code program on several books, including Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. He claims he found nothing of significance. Drosnan is convinced that the secret code is exclusive to the Bible. Every major figure in world history I have looked for, every major event in world history I have looked for, has been encoded accurately in remarkable detail in the Bible. To date, Drosnan says he has uncovered hundreds of encoded references to historical persons and events. What then are we to make of the dire predictions he believes the Bible code makes for our future? The most terrible warning that's encoded in the Bible is of a possible nuclear world war within the next 10 years. The words world war and atomic holocaust 
are both encoded in the Bible with the same two years, the years 2000 and 2006. I'm not calling that a prediction, but a warning. That's what I think the Bible code really is, a series of warnings of dangers we can prevent if we take the warnings seriously. Well, now, wait a minute. You can't prophesize the end will come, the end might not come, the end might be delayed, or the end might not come at all. You've now made all possible predictions, which is no prediction at all. That's not prophecy. The Bible code, as far as I'm concerned, does not predict anything. It warns us of possible dangers. It doesn't give us one predetermined future, but all of our possible futures. Mr. Drosnin is a journalist. He is reporting on a very complex mathematical work of world-renowned mathematicians. He has not used scientific methodology, and his actual conclusions are logically unsound. It is far better, in my mind, to sound a false warning than to fail to warn of a real danger. People sometimes say to me, Where's the good news in the Bible code? Why all these predictions of terrible catastrophes? And I say the good news is that some intelligence cared enough about us to encode the Bible and leave us these warnings so that these dangers could, in fact, be prevented. Teenagers may run away, toddlers may wander off, but if a baby disappears, more often than not, foul play is involved. A couple in a suburb of Tampa, Florida, claimed someone took their baby, kidnapped her in the dead of night. Only one thing is certain, the baby is missing. November 24, 1997, Marlene Eisenberg says she got up shortly after six that morning and went into the kitchen. And I noticed the laundry room door to the garage is opened. And I'm like, whoa, what's that doing open? And I just run to the first bedroom. And I look in Sabrina's crib, and she was gone. And I was just like, you know, I was hysterical. Steve, you know, Sabrina's missing. Sabrina's gone. Sabrina, Steve and Marlene Eisenberg's third child, barely five months old, had vanished taken from her own crib. The Eisenbergs' home was now a crime scene. This frightened a lot of people, terrified a lot of young parents. It was chilling for people who lived in that community. It was a quiet, safe, out-of-the-way place, and then a baby disappears. How could a baby just disappear? The Eisenbergs had left their garage door open overnight. The interior door may also have been left unlocked, but there were no clues about an intruder. Who took baby Sabrina? Marlene Eisenberg says the investigation suddenly took an unexpected turn. She and her husband became prime suspects. No forced entry, no ransom note. We think you had something to do with the disappearance of Sabrina. Why don't you just tell us where Sabrina is? To me, it was the most unbelievable thing I could have ever heard. And, you know, I was like, I have no idea where Sabrina is. I have no idea who took her. That's why you're here. Help, you know, find her. Deputies removed a number of items from the Eisenberg home, including Sabrina's crib and bedding. They were sent to the FBI lab at Quantico for analysis. As the search for baby Sabrina continued, the Eisenbergs taped a public appeal pleading for her return. This morning, someone came into our home and took our baby Sabrina Page out of her crib. The plea might have inspired sympathy for the Eisenbergs. It did not. Some people felt they were guilty of something. Some people felt that they were involved in some way in Sabrina's disappearance. The day after Sabrina vanished, the media taped the Eisenbergs smiling as they left their home. Public opinion counted it as another strike against them. A lot of people in the community saw that clip and saw Steve's smile and they saw Marlene with a quick 
flash of a smile and they jumped to conclusions. They said, why would these people be smiling? There must be something wrong here. Are you withholding any information? The Eisenbergs voluntarily took a polygraph no. test. Did you help take your daughter from your home that night? No. Do you have any knowledge of your daughter's current location? No. In Marlene's case, the results are a matter of debate. Did you help? They told me it was inconclusive. And they told me that they expected it to be that because I was hysterical and, you know, everything. And uh, my baby's gone and, you know, they would expect that. Are you lying about your daughter's disappearance? The sheriff's office insists Marlene Eisenberg's polygraph results were not inconclusive. No, but officials not. won't say whether she passed or failed. No. I don't give a damn about Hillsborough County polygraph. Shortly after Sabrina disappeared, the Eisenbergs hired an attorney. To some, it was another sign of their guilt. The Eisenbergs say the police left them no choice. When the police sit across from you and say, we believe you know where your daughter is and we believe you know who has her, there's a good reason to get an attorney. <laughs> Months passed, and still no trace of the baby. The police held several press conferences fairly early on in the case and told the reporters that, in fact, they had evidence and that we should just hang on, that they were processing the evidence and that it would be forthcoming. Uh, that was almost a year ago, and I've not seen any of that evidence to date. The police declined to comment on any evidence in this case including the results of tests done in the FBI lab at Quantico. Unfortunately, most of the leads bring us back to a dead end, and that comes, brings us back to this community. And we feel that the answers to this crime are within this community. Our policy has always been that we don't list people as a suspect unless we have enough to charge them. We have not ruled the Eisenbergs out. They um, have f failed to assist us in some ways, and it makes it more difficult to rule them out as a, um, having some involvement in the case. The Eisenbergs continue to maintain Sabrina was kidnapped. I believe that somebody came into our home and just took her. It had to be someone who wanted a baby so bad and they couldn't have one themselves or they needed money so bad that they would want to sell her. It could be that somebody just watched Marlene and I and, and saw our habits of occasionally leaving the garage open, knew we had uh, a baby, or it could have been somebody that knew us casually and then through others knew our, our habits. So, it, it, you know, anything is just pure speculation. Update. In September of 1999, a federal grand jury indicted Marlene and Steven Eisenberg on charges of conspiracy and lying to investigators about the disappearance of Sabrina. Two years later, a judge threw the indictment out by lambasting prosecutors for misrepresenting the strength of their case. The U.S. attorney has agreed to reimburse the Eisenbergs for the cost of their legal counsel. Thirty-one-year-old Lee Carter Jr. was a kind of guy who always tried to do the right thing. But on the morning of July 28, 1993, it seems doing the right thing got Lee Carter Jr. killed. A bomb placed under the seat of his Porsche, parked outside Carter's home, ended his life instantly. For members of Carter's family, the loss has been unbearable. There's been no closure of any kind. I wake up in the morning, he's the first thing I think about. I go to bed at night, I'd say most of the time it's the first thing I'm thinking about, the last thing I'm thinking about. Who would want to kill Lee Carter Jr.? Police in Carter's upstate New York hometown have a suspect. They would like your help in finding him. They believe he is a dangerous killer, a man they suspect is an enforcer for an outlaw branch of the Hells Angels motorcycle gang. The man's name is Rick Valley. And if you happen to know him, be careful.
In the early 1990s, police believe Valley led the Angels in a battle for control of drugs and prostitution along the U.S.-Canadian border. Police allege Valley's job was to kill people who double-crossed the biker gang. Lee Carter Jr. had been approached by associates of Rick Valley who wanted to use his home as a safe house. It is alleged that Valley and the gang had plans to smuggle 54 kilos of cocaine from the United States into Canada. And Carter's home was close to the border. Carter went to the police and agreed to act as an informant. The drug deal was quickly thwarted, and Rick Valley was charged with conspiracy to import cocaine. My son didn't get into detail on it to me at all. He did tell me he was working with the state police. He told me he was helping them. And I started to ask him what it was about, and he said it was best that I didn't get involved in it, that what he was doing was with them and was on the up and up with the law. Before the case could go to trial, Lee Carter Jr., the main witness, was eliminated. Police believe Rick Valley, a known demolitions expert, planted the bomb that killed him. Rick Valley obviously made the decision that if he took out the witness, uh, had the witness killed, then there was nobody to testify him against court, the drug charge would have to be dismissed, which, in effect, is what happened. Two days after Carter's murder, with a star witness against him dead, the drug charges against Rick Valley were dropped. Two years passed. During that time, New York State and Canadian authorities gathered enough evidence to charge Valley with Carter's murder. Valley was arrested in Canada and was awaiting extradition to the United States. While in custody, Rick Valley had his jaw broken in a jailhouse fight. Over the next few weeks, he was treated at a local hospital, where two guards would always accompany him. During the course of his visit, he had uh, consistently set up where he would take a shower around 8 o'clock. Uh, at this particular point, uh, he had been on the phone and indicated to one of the guards that uh, he would like the guard to wait there because he was waiting for an important phone call from uh, his attorney. Uh, he then went to take a shower with the other guard. As the both of them entered the shower room, uh, the one guard was accosted. What took you out? With the help of an accomplice, Valley escaped. It's the last time anyone has seen Rick Valley. My gut sense is that he's out of the country uh, and that he's gone someplace else and has uh, probably uh, established a new identity. Obviously, we'd love to have somebody call us and tell us, well, Rick Valley is in this house right now having dinner. Uh, and I can assure you that uh, within moments, uh, we'd, uh, we'd be there and uh, get him into custody. When I think of uh, Richard Valley, uh, I think of an individual that thinks nothing of taking life, thinks nothing of uh, anyone else whatsoever. He is it, and that's all. He has no values. It would help considerably to know that at least the individual wasn't out there living high on the hog while he has taken someone else's life. Escape Convict ends thanks to one of our viewers. On a previous broadcast, we asked for your help in finding a ruthless killer who'd escaped from an Oklahoma prison. Michael Wayne Brown was able to elude law enforcement authorities for over 15 years. But thanks to an Unsolved Mysteries viewer, Brown is now back behind bars. When he was only 18, Michael Wayne Brown and another teenager were in the middle of burglarizing an insurance office when an employee stopped by to pick up a file. Give me the gun. Turn around! Ah! 
Brown was put on death row for murdering Richard Sullivan. However, that sentence was later commuted to life without parole. Michael Wayne Brown had served nine years in the Oklahoma state prison system when his luck began to change. A lonely widow named Donna Moses began writing him letters as part of her church group's attempt to help convicts find spiritual comfort. Hi. But these Hi. pen pals quickly Michael. became something more. She was lonely. She hadn't had anybody for a very long time. And she needed that companionship, you know, someone, someone, you know, to talk to her about things and show her love and affection. And that's what she got from him. Do you, Michael Wayne Brown, take this woman to be your lawful Less than three months wife, after meeting Brown, Donna Moses married him. In November of 1984, Brown was transferred to a minimum security prison. It was a perfect opportunity, and he wasted little time. Michael Wayne Brown and another inmate jumped a four-foot fence and raced for freedom. Authorities believe that Donna Moses Brown drove the getaway car. Within a year, the second convict was captured. For 15 years, authorities received numerous tips about the whereabouts of Michael and Donna Brown. And then, finally, one paid off. Update. In 1999, an alert Unsolved Mysteries viewer chanced upon a photograph from our website. I couldn't believe it. Um, it looked like him, but my mind said it's not him, but the picture said it was him. Greg knew Donna and Michael Brown as Linda and Kenneth Ginter. The Ginters owned a video store in the quiet suburb of Ketterling, Ohio. In fact, Greg's wife worked at the store. You'd never know he was a murderer. You would never know that. Um, like I say, he was like an icon of the community. Everybody liked him. The kids would come in there and high-five him. He'd give him candy and super nice guy. Coincidentally, about 15 minutes after spotting the photos on the Unsolved Mysteries website, Greg received a phone call from Kenneth Ginter. The phone rings, and it was him. And he was asking my wife to work that night. I told him that I'd seen a guy on the computer that looked like him. And I said, Michael Wayne Brown. And he kind of got quiet for a minute. And he says, well, Greg, everybody has a twin. So I left it at that. Realizing that he had been recognized, Brown quietly dropped from sight. But knowing that the FBI was one step behind him, he turned himself in. Brown is serving the remainder of his sentence at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma. Authorities viewed Donna Brown as the hapless victim of her husband. She was never charged with any wrongdoing in connection with Brown's escape. For every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Join me for the next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.